OK, now usually at this point, uh, it would fall to me to introduce our first speaker for this morning. But given that I am the first speaker, allow me to introduce myself. Uh, my name is uh, James Davis. I am a reader in social anthropology and mental health here at the University of Roehampton. And I'm co-founder of CEP along with uh, Luke Montague. Uh, I've also written on the problems of modern day psychiatry, in particular in a book I wrote for the general reader published in 2013 called Cracked. And I'm going to present a little bit from that book today, in particular focusing on psychiatric diagnosis. Now we felt it important to begin a conference on psychiatric medications with a focus on psychiatric diagnosis because receiving a diagnosis or some kind of diagnostic test is really the first step for most people to receiving a psychiatric prescription. So if there is something wrong or problematic with our diagnostic system, then everything that follows therefrom is also to some extent problematic. So in other words, psychiatric medications can be criticized not only on the grounds of the potential harms they may cause, but also on the grounds that the diagnostic justification for prescribing them leaves much to be desired. So what I'm going to argue uh, today is that psychiatry, under the dominance of the biomedical model over the last 40 years, has wrongly medicalized increasing numbers of people in contemporary society. So apparently one in four of us now suffers from a mental health disorder in any given year. And I'm going to argue that this figure is so startlingly high because psychiatry has simply renamed more and more of our natural and normal, albeit painful, human experiences as indicating psychiatric conditions that oftentimes require some kind of uh, psychopharmaceutical intervention. So by reclassifying normality as abnormality, psychiatry has helped create the illusion of a psychiatric epidemic. I'm not suggesting the suffering itself is illusory, but our tendency to see that suffering as psychiatric in nature. Now at the heart of this illusion, I'm going to argue, sits a book called the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the book that includes all of the mental disorders that psychiatry believes to exist. Now the interesting thing about this book is that it has expanded at a faster rate than almost any other medical manual in history. So for example, in the 1960s, it included around 106 disorders, whereas today it includes around 370. So what is going on? Well, that's the question I set out to answer when uh, writing part of uh, my book. But I encountered an immediate problem, and it was this that there is very little documentary evidence chartering the processes that the committees who wrote the DSM followed when they put that manual together. So I soon realized if I were to write some kind of reconstruction of events, then I would have to go and speak to the people who wrote that manual. So that's what I did. I started with somebody called Dr. Robert Spitzer, who's now generally regarded to be the most influential psychiatrist of the 20th century because he was chairperson of DSM-3, published in 1980. He headed a team of around nine people. It went up to 13 at one point, but it was really a team, a core team of nine people called the Task Force who wrote and put that manual together. Now, I'm starting with DSM-3 today because by far it was the most important addition in the manual's history. It established the modern diagnostic system under which we still broadly operate today. It introduced 80 brand new mental disorders, many of the household name disorders with which some of you may be uh, familiar. And it significantly lowered the bar for what constitutes mental illness with respect to many conditions, uh, including uh, depression. So what I'm gonna do is present you a composite of the data I gathered from interviewing key members of the task force and the data I gathered from consulting the DSM archives in Washington DC uh, last year in March. But before I get to that uh, data, let me first set the scene. On a sunny May morning in 2012, 
I catch the train from New York City. As we leave Penn Station, the train slowly shunts and rattles under the Hudson River before emerging onto the wasteland of industrial New Jersey. After passing for about 30 minutes through a bleak landscape of gnarled bogland and abandoned warehouses, signs of plusher suburbia begin to break through. As the gain, uh, train gains pace with each passing mile, the outside scene grows steadily more affluent. The houses get bigger, the cars shinier, and the landscape lusher until 50 minutes later we terminate at Princeton University. Now, I travelled to Princeton that early May morning because uh, three years earlier, uh, Dr. Robert Spitzer had moved out there from nearby Westchester. His wife had taken a job at a local research laboratory, and Spitzer, now in his late 70s, had decided to embark upon one last adventure. They had chosen a large and comfortable house in the historic leafy suburbs just northeast of the university, and as my taxi pulled up outside, it was clear they had chosen well. I approach the house, knock on the door, Spitzer opens it, dressed in sandals, uh, shorts, a loose sports top. One of the first things he says to me is, do you want to stay for lunch? And I just finished one of those mountainous American breakfasts, so I, you know, I struggled to decline him politely, but then... Uh, to my great relief, he said, well, why don't we first sit down so I can tell you what you want to know? So one of the first questions I had for Spitzer <clears throat> concerned what was the rationale for the huge expansion of the DSM that happened under his watch, 80 new disorders, as I mentioned a moment ago. He said the following... The disorders we included weren't really new to the field. They were mainly diagnoses that clinicians used in practice, but which weren't recognized by the DSM. So by including them in the DSM, we gave them professional recognition. So presumably these disorders had been discovered in a biological sense. That's why they were included, right? No, not at all. There are only a handful of mental disorders in the DSM known to have a clear biological cause. These are known as the organic disorders. These are few and far between. So, let me get this clear. There are no discovered biological causes for many of the remaining mental disorders in the DSM. It's not for many, it's for any. No biological markers have been identified. Now let me just for a moment say why this may sound strange to many people, perhaps not people in this room, but to many people out there in wider society. It may sound strange because we expect psychiatry to work much like the rest of modern mainstream medicine. In mainstream medicine, and of course there are exceptions to this, but it's broadly the case that a name will only be ratified as indicating uh, a physical disorder after its pathological roots have been discovered in the body, such as in the cells, the tissue, the organs, etc. The surprising thing about psychiatry, however, is that it works in completely the opposite way. Psychiatry first names a disorder before any pathological roots have been discovered in the body. So in effect, a new mental disorder can make it into the DSM and become part of our wider culture even though there is no biological evidence to support its inclusion. So I continued. So if there are no known biological causes, on what grounds do mental disorders make it into the DSM? What other evidence supports their inclusion? Well, psychiatry has to look for other things, behavioral, psychological. We have other procedures. I asked what these were. I guess our general principle was that if a large enough number of clinicians felt that a diagnostic concept was important in their work, then we were likely to add it as a new category. That was essentially it. It became a question of how much consensus there was to recognize and include a particular disorder. So it was agreement that determined what went into the DSM. That was essentially how it went, right. Another important point to be made here Agreement does not constitute scientific proof. For example, if a group of theologians all come together and agree that God exists, this does not prove that God exists. All it proves is that this group of theologians believe it does. So in what sense is DSM agreement different? Why, when a committee of uh, DSM practitioners comes together 
and agrees upon something should the rest of us accept they have got it right? Well, the obvious answer to that question would be, well, surely there were other forms of research that were guiding the committee in reaching the agreements they did. And to address that now, I want to uh, bring into the conversation someone called Paula J. Kaplan, who was professor of psychology at Harvard uh, Kennedy School. Now, she, uh, Paula is very important because she uh, was a consultant on DSM-3 and also aggressively uh, lobbied at DSM not to include a new disorder. This disorder was called self-defeating personality disorder. or SDPD for short. Now, she argued uh, this shouldn't be included because there was a, a historical precedent in the legal literature of uh, female victims of violence being diagnosed with this condition. The reason for that is because the characteristics of SDPD were very similar to the characteristics that certain women displayed when they had been f victims of violence. So the danger with this diagnosis is that it could end up pathologizing female victims of violence, but in addition to that, it could also end up um, letting the perpetrators of such violence off the hook, because presumably they were just doing what these women wanted, because they had a self-defeating personality disorder. So for these two reasons, she lobbied Spitzer not to include the diagnosis, but he remained adamant. So in a last-ditch effort to influence him, she decided on a new strategy. As she says... I decided to scrutinize thoroughly the very research used to justify including SDPD in the DSM. Now let's have a little look at what she found. Firstly, she only found two pieces of research, which is a remarkably small amount by anyone's standards. But let's now have a little look at what that research constituted. The first piece of research was conducted by Spitzer himself. He gathered a group of psychiatrists at only one university who already accepted that SDPD existed, and they were shown some old case studies. All then unanimously agreed the patients in them had SDPD. Kaplan pointed out that just because some psychiatrists at one hospital all diagno diagnosed their patients with SDPD, was not proof that the disorder actually exists. All it proves, as Kaplan said, is that a group of psychiatrists working in the same institution gave the same label, rightly or wrongly, to a given set of behaviours. It proves nothing more than that. But if you think that first piece of research is weak, then just consider the second piece. A questionnaire was sent to a selected number of members of the American Psychiatric Association. This asked them whether the diagnosis SDPD should be included in the DSM. An official report conducted by the psychologists Cutchins and Kirk showed, after doing the calculations, that only 11% voted yes, which is surely not a representative sample of the psychiatric community. Now, you may say, well, look, Sure, James, but maybe you're, you're, you're cherry-picking here. You're taking this example, it's an extreme example, in order to make a wider point. And that would be a fair uh, response uh, to make. So let me uh, now bring into the conversation someone called Dr. Theodore Millen, a key member of Robert Spitzer's task force. The following quote it refers to not just SDBD, but all of the disorders that Spitzer's team included. This is what Theodore Millen said. There was very little systematic research, and much of the research that existed was really a hodgepodge, scattered, inconsistent, and ambiguous. I think the majority of us recognized that the amount of good, solid science upon which we were making our decisions was pretty <coughs> modest. So let's go back now <clears throat> to my sitting in the room with Robert Spitzer at his home in Princeton. I decided to read to Spitzer this quote, to see what he made of it. And after a short and somewhat uncomfortable silence, Spitzer responded in a way I simply had not expected. He said the following. Well, it is true that for many of the disorders that were added, there wasn't a tremendous amount of research. And certainly there wasn't research on the particular way we define these disorders. In the case of Millen's quote, I think he's mainly referring to the personality disorders. But again, it is certainly true that the amount of research validating data on most psychiatric disorders is very limited indeed. 
So you're saying that there was little research not only supporting your inclusion of new disorders, but also supporting how these disorders should be defined? There are very few disorders whose definition was a result of specific research data. Now, I was so surprised by this admission that I decided to check it out with other members of his, his task force. So on a rainy English morning, once I returned to London, I called uh, someone called Professor Donald Klein from my office here in this uh, university. I read to Klein what Spitzer has said to me to see what he made of it. And this is how he responded. And incidentally, uh, Donald Klein was unofficially second in command of the task force, so a very important figure indeed. Sure, we had very little in the way of data, so we were forced to rely on clinical consensus, which admittedly is a very poor way to do things. But it was better than anything else we had. So without data to guide you, how was this consensus reached? We thrashed it out, basically. We had a three-hour argument. There would be about 12 people sitting down at a table. Usually there was a chairperson and there was somebody taking notes. And at the end of each meeting, there would be a distribution of events. And at the next meeting, some would agree with the inclusion and others would continue arguing. If people were still divided, the matter would be eventually decided by a vote. A vote? Really? Sure, that is how it went. I then tried uh, to check this out with, again, other members of the task force, and the next person uh, I spoke to was someone called uh, Henry uh, Pinsker. This is what he said about the voting method. Some things were discussed over a number of different meetings, which would sometimes be followed by an exchange and memoranda about it. And then there would simply be a vote. People would raise hands. There weren't that many people. Regarding the legitimacy of this method, Pinsker continued... We never had any question that that was how we should proceed. I had no re reservations at all about working that way. And incidentally, um, when I visited the archives in Washington, D.C., I managed to source uh, 12 uh, minuted meetings of the task force with the archivist there. And uh, 10 out of those 12 meetings provided evidence of voting taking place within the meetings. And not just uh, voting on one issue, but on many different issues. That's just to say the archival data very much supports uh, what we're hearing here from members of the task force itself. Finally, an important point needs to be made here. Um, it's an obvious one, but I'm going to make it nonetheless. Voting isn't a scientific activity. <laughs> <coughs> When anything is voted into existence, whether it's a new union leader, a new political party, or indeed a new mental disorder, the likelihood we've got it wrong is never far away. So let me now um, turn to somebody called Rene Garfinkel. She uh, was a consultant on DSM-3. She's important because she sat in on many of the task force meetings. I spoke to her in 2013. This is what she said. You must understand, what I saw happening on these committees wasn't scientific. It more resembled a group of friends trying to decide where they want to go for dinner. <laughs> One person says, I feel like Chinese food. Another person says, no, 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 I'm really more in the mood for Indian food. And finally, after some discussion and collaborative give and take, they all decide to go have Italian. She then gave me an example of how far down the scale of intellectual respectability she felt these meetings could sometimes fall. On one occasion, I was sitting in on a task force meeting and there was a discussion about whether a particular behaviour should be classed as a symptom of a particular disorder. And as the conversation went on, to my great astonishment, one task force member suddenly piped up. Oh, no, 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 we, we can't include that behaviour as a symptom because I do that. <laughs> And, and so it was decided that that behaviour wouldn't be included because presumably if someone on the task force does it, it must be perfectly normal. Um, I'm going to give you some general impressions uh, of how these meetings unfolded, gathered from my interviews and other sources. According to other members of the task force, these meetings were often haphazard affairs. Suddenly these things would happen and there didn't seem to be much basis for it except that someone just decided all of a sudden to run with it, one participant 
uh, said one participant. It seemed, another member admitted, that the loudest voices usually won out. With no extensive data one could turn to, the outcome of task force decisions often depended on who in the room had the strongest personality. But the problem with relying on consensus, reiterated Garfinkel, is that in the discussion, some voices will just get quieter, either because they don't want to fight or because they see they are in the minority. And snap, that's when a decision is made. Admittedly, when the task force lacked expertise on a particular disorder, Spitzer would consult relevant leaders in the field. But this also led to chaotic meetings that members often found difficult to participate in. One of the only British uh, psychiatrists on the task force, a psychiatrist called David Schaffer, recalled how such meetings often unfolded. In these meetings of the so-called experts or advisors, people would be standing and sitting and moving around, but people would talk on top of each other. But Bob would be too busy typing notes to chair the meeting in an orderly way. In 2005, a really interesting article was published in the New Yorker magazine uh, by a journalist called Alex Spiegel. It was called, uh, entitled A Dictionary of Disorder, and it was a biographical account of Robert Spitzer's influence on uh, modern psychiatry. Now, midway through that article, there's a very interesting section on the construction of DSM, and I'm going to quote from that article now because it is pertinent to what I'm, I'm, I'm talking about today. Roger Peel and Paul Lasada, psychiatrists at St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington, D.C., wrote a paper in which they used the term hysterical psychoses to describe the behavior of two kinds of patients they had observed. Spitzer read the paper and asked Peel and Lasada if he could come to Washington to meet them. During a 40-minute conversation, the three decided that hysterical psychoses uh, should really be divided into two disorders, brief reactive psychosis and factitious disorder. Then Bob asked for a typewriter, Peel says. To Peel's surprise, Spitzer drafted the definitions on the spot. He banged out criteria sets for factitious disorder and for brief reactive psychosis, and it struck me that this was a productive fellow. He comes in to talk about an issue and walks away with diagnostic criteria for two different mental disorders. And incidentally, both of these disorders went into the DSM with only very minor modification from those original criteria. So let me just read a couple of paragraphs before continuing. As soon as Spitzer's DSM-3 was published in 1980, it became a sensation overnight. The almost 500-page long manual sold out immediately. The publisher of the DSM, the American Psychiatric Association, was taken completely off guard. It took approximately six months to catch up with all the uh, orders that came flooding in. The new manual was purchased not only by psychiatrists, but by nurses, social workers, lawyers, psychologists, psychotherapists. And the enthusiasm quickly spread far beyond the United States. In Britain, for example, uh, the manual had such impact that by the end of the 1980s, most British psychiatrists were being trained to use the DSM. Furthermore, Spitzer's DSM categories quickly became those that guided all research into psychiatric disorders internationally. This meant that the disorders that were studied by researchers in Germany, Australia, Canada, Britain, India, and so on and so forth, were those defined and listed in Spitzer's DSM. In short, the book ultimately changed the fundamental nature of research and practice within the field, not to mention the lives of tens of millions of people diagnosed with the psychiatric disorders listed therein. And yet, as the influence of the manual spread, the truth about its construction remained obscure. Most professionals using the manual simply did not know, and I would venture still do not know today, the extent to which biological evidence or solid research failed to guide the choices the task force made. They did not know that the definitions of the disorders contrived, the validity of the disorders included, and the symptom thresholds people must meet in order to receive the diagnosis were not decided on the basis of rigorous research, but were the product of committee uh, opinions or decisions which, at best, 
reflected the well-meaning professional opinions of a small subset of psychiatrists. In short, most people did not know that the fundamental changes Spitzer brought to global psychiatry only required the consensus of an extremely small group of people, nine people. And indeed, as Spitzer openly confirmed to me in uh, our interview, our team was certainly not typical of the psychiatric community, and that was one of the major arguments against DSM-3. It allowed a small group with a particular viewpoint to take over psychiatry and change it in a fundamental way. What did you make of that criticism? What did I make of that charge? Well, it was absolutely true. It was a revolution, that's what it was. We took over because we had the power. Now, um, I'm just going to spend uh, a further nine minutes, if I may, uh, moving forward into DSM-4. Uh, I'll be far briefer, I, I promise. Um, in 1994, DSM-3 reaches the end of its shelf life and is replaced by DSM-4, which is the DSM that remained in use for nearly 20 years, right up until May 2013, when DSM-5 uh, emerged. In 2002 and two, uh, 2012 and 13, I interviewed the new chairperson of, of DSM-4, Alan Francis, on a couple of occasions. And one of the first questions I had for Alan Francis was, with the benefit of hindsight, was there anything that your team did uh, when putting together DSM-4 that you now regret? And he answered in the following way. Well, the first thing I have to say about that is that DSM-4 was a remarkably unambitious and modest effort to stabilize psychiatric diagnosis and not to create new problems. This meant keeping the introduction of new disorders to an absolute minimum. This needs a bit of qualification. Uh, what does he mean by that? Well, his team only introduced about eight new mental disorders into the main text, which is indeed a modest amount compared to the 80 introduced by Spitzer. On the other hand, from another standpoint, this claim to modesty is very shaky because it doesn't take into account the following things. Firstly, France's team actually expanded the DSM by 30 other disorders, but put them in the appendix and subdivided many existing conditions in effect creating new ones. So if you count the appendix occlusions and the subdivisions, all of which people can and are diagnosed with, then his team actually expanded the DSM from around 270 disorders to around 370, which is, the, in my view, the opposite of uh, conservatism. So we continued. Yet despite that conservatism, we learned some pretty tough lessons. We learned overall that even if you make minimal changes to the DSM, the way the world uses the manual is not always the way you intended it to be used. For instance, we added bipolar 2, Asperger's disorder, and finally we added ADHD, and well, these decisions help promote three false epidemics in psychiatry. I asked him what he meant by that. Well, we now have a rate of autism that is 20 times what it was 15 years ago. By adding bipolar 2, we also doubled the ratio of bipolar versus unipolar depression, resulting in lots more use of antipsychotic and mood stabilizer drugs. Rates of ADHD also tripled, partly because new drug treatments were released that were aggressively marketed. So every decision you make has a trade-off. You can't assume the way you write the DSM will be the way it'll be used. So the way the DSM is being used has led to the medicalization of a number of people who don't warrant their diagnoses. Exactly. Can you put a figure on how many people have been wrongly medicalized? There is no right answer to who should be diagnosed. There is no gold standard for psychiatric diagnosis, so it's impossible to know for sure. But when the diagnosis rates triple over the course of 15 years, my assumption is that medicalization is going on. And that's, uh, I think, a very uh, important uh, admission for Francis to make, and he's made it in, in many other uh, places. But could the situation be even worse than that? Because Francis is only talking about the main disorders he put in the main manual. He's not talking about the appendix inclusions. Also, he's not talking about the existing problem of medicalization he allowed to live on through into DSM-4 from DSM-3. 
So for example, let me give you uh, some instance, some of the disorders he allowed to live on. We have things like uh, female orgasmic disorder, caffeine-related disorder, stammering, uh, stuttering, uh, transsexualism, oppositional defiant disorder, which is something I, I suffer from uh, quite, a, quite acutely. <coughs> now, no, nobody is suggesting that these things aren't experienced as problems by certain people, but whether or not they constitute psychiatric disorders is another matter entirely. So my final question for Francis, and we're coming to the end now, my final question for Francis was, given that there was poor research backing for many of the disorders, why did you allow them to live on into DSM-4? Why didn't you simply remove them on, on the basis that there was poor research backing or on the basis that they were some of them were just plainly eccentric? And he responded in the following way. If we were going to either add new diagnoses or eliminate existing ones, there had to be substantial scientific evidence <laughs> to support that decision. And there simply wasn't. So by following our, our own conservative rules, we couldn't reduce the system any more than we could increase it. Now, you could argue that that is a questionable approach, but we felt it was important to stabilise the system and not make arbitrary decisions in either direction. But one of the problems with proceeding in that way is that it assumes the DSM system you inherited from Spitzer was fit for purpose. For example, it assumes that the disorders Spitzer's, Spitzer's team included and the diagnostic thresholds Spitzer's team set were themselves scientifically established. We did not assume that at all. We knew that everything that came before was arbitrary. Francis quickly corrects himself. We knew that most decisions that came before were arbitrary. I had been involved in DSM-3. I understood the limitations probably more than most people did. But the most important value at that time was to stabilise the system, not change it arbitrarily. So you're essentially saying that you set out to stabilise the arbitrary decisions that were made during the construction of DSM-3? In other words, corrected Francis, it felt better to stabilise the existing arbitrary decisions than to create a whole assortment of new ones. <laughs> and, I th and I thought it was a good place to, to bring our interview to a, to a close there. <laughs> so, um, and I'm now going to bring my presentation to a close. So finally, uh, what I've discussed today, I think, poses a serious challenge to those who embrace the conventional view that mental disorders are discrete patterns of biologically rooted pathological feeling and behaviour identified by way of objective research processes. What an inspection of the construction of DSM rather reveals is that the separate disorders into which DSM organised diverse behavioural and mental phenomena were largely the outcome of vote-based judgments settled by a small, culturally homogenous subset of mental health professionals who were socially positioned at a given point in time to have their judgments ratified by the institutional apparatus of the American Psychiatric Association. Now, while such judgments may indicate that a group of professionals sharing similar socio-cultural beliefs, biases, persuasions and interests may see some things in the same way at a given point in time, they do not confirm that what they see is either objectively true or stable in any verifiable sense. And certainly such judgments do not provide any robust empirical justification for the vaulting levels of psychopharmaceutical prescribing that we have seen in recent years and about which we will hear far more today. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you.